Welcome back to the Channel Family and another broadcast, Paul Peterhead, Scotland. I'm really pleased to be joined this morning by Mark. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so welcome to the podcast family. If you are looking for support and or sponsorship, feel free to pop your number in the chat wherever you see this uh, broadcast posted and we will get back to you. We have current male and female sponsorship list, which we can send you uh, on WhatsApp. Um, so if that's something you're looking for, put your number and your first name in the chat below and we will send you that. There's also a heap of other resources. Uh, and there's a thriving community on WhatsApp of people in sobriety that uh, where there's lots of resources and encouragement posted on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, let us know in the chat. During this broadcast, there'll be various uh, resources posted on the screen, not, list, not least a list of meetings uh, that you can attend, public Zoom meetings uh, that you're very welcome at. And there'll also be information about how to get to face-to-face -face meetings there is, of course, the ca.org website uh, and the ukanonymous.org.uk website as well, where you can find out about resources, get literature and British events for recovery. Um, yep, so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark, and I'll just hand the floor over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, as you said, my name is Mark. I'm a very grateful recovered addict. And I use the word recovered because it says it in the front page of the book. I hear a lot of controversy saying you're not recovered, you're recovering. But the word recovered actually means restored to a normal state of mental and physical health. Um, and that's what I, I get. I get that on a daily basis, but it's contingent on me practicing these principles in all areas of my life and working these 12 steps. So a little bit about me, what qualifies me to be here talking to you today? Um, I was a hopeless drug addict for 35 years of my life. I'm not going to go into a lot of war stories because um, I don't think there's any room for that. I will tell you I had my first drink at 12 and that put me in hospital because I drank and drank and drank until I couldn't stop. I'll tell you I had my first overdose at 17 and I'll tell you I've had numerous surgeries and I had bits of me cut off through this addiction of mine. But none of that, these were these ominous warnings that I uh, failed to heed. They were all just events that happened in my life. Didn't consider them and didn't look at the cause and the effect and didn't realise who I was as a little boy running around in a man's body for the longest time. Um, it says in the book that people drink and use drugs because they like the effect. And I'll be honest, I liked the effect. Not because I enjoyed getting high, particularly, because it took me out of self. And I am ill-equipped to deal with life on life's terms, or at least I was until I found this program. And like most addiction stories, it never got any better. It always got worse. And by the end of it, having prayed to a deity I swore I didn't believe in, to anybody who would listen, no end of times to keep me out of trouble, to get me through to the morning, I found myself praying to this same deity to take me. I was using to die. I didn't want to be here anymore, and I couldn't handle life on life's terms. I was in a relationship and we were both enabling each other. Um, and it just got worse and worse and worse. We changed from two people who cared a lot about each other and were actually half decent people when we met into just horrible, horrible to each other. It was awful, was toxic. And after 12 weeks of praying to God to take me every time I got high, please don't let me wake up in the morning. The last weekend I remember saying to my now ex-partner, can't handle another weekend like this last one something's got to change promise me it's not going to be the same and we did the usual we got a weekend stash on a friday night and it'd all be gone by saturday morning and we went at it heavy friday night and we did an awful lot that night more than many two people should be doing but i didn't care you know i was quite happy if i didn't wake up in the morning but i did wake up in this morning and i had what i consider my first spiritual awakening Something inside of me decided I could not carry on anymore. And I watched my ex-partner finish the last three bags from the night stash. And I didn't want one. And she was encouraging me, saying, I feel bad doing it on my own. I was like, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want this life anymore. And the following morning, I asked her to leave. She was rather disinclined to leave. But she did leave under duress. Um... It wasn't particularly a pleasant experience. We both said and did some horrible things. And then she left and I was left in this house all alone. And when I say all alone, I mean, I was all alone. My phone did not ring. 
I didn't have anybody who I could reach out to and ask for help because everybody who'd got close to me, I had lied to, cheated and manipulated. So I sat in this house and I decided the best thing I could do, my delusional thinking told me the best thing I could do would be to end my life. I never once considered the trauma that that would cause my then 15 year old daughter or my parents. Parents who weren't exactly shining examples of parenthood, you could say, but they did the best they could with the tools that they had. Never once thought about them. My mind told me it would be the best thing. But I had a little bit of hesitance over it, so I decided to toss a coin, and I said, heads, I'm going to take my own life, and tails, I'm not, and it came out tails. And I was gutted. But I'd made this deal with myself, so I woke up the following morning, tossed and turned all night, and I got dressed and I went to work and I got one junction down the motorway, a freeway for any of our American friends listening. And I realized I'd left my work's laptop at home, which meant I had to turn around and come back for it. And by the time I come home, I'd already made the decision that I was going to kill myself. So I laid on my bed and I took an inordinate amount of cocodamol. The doctors were amazed that I survived. Didn't send any messages out to anyone. It wasn't a cry for help. I just did not want to be here anymore. I was tired of being scared, scared of who I had become, scared of all the things that had happened to me and all the things that were yet to come. Scared of not being able to look myself in the mirror because I couldn't stand the person looking back at me. And through God's providence, somebody found me. They took me to the hospital and I didn't particularly want to go, but my dad forced me to go get in the ambulance. And I spent four days having different things pumped into me to stop my organs shutting down. And I survived without any scarring to my liver, which is a miracle. None of the doctors could believe after taking as many strong cocodamol as I had that I was still there. But something else happened to me while I was laid in that hospital bed. I had a realisation that I could never be honest with myself unless I started being honest with everybody around me. I had no idea about recovery. I had no idea about the 12-step programme. I had no idea about the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But something spoke to me and told me I needed to be truthful. So I told my dad everything, literally everything. I told him all the horrible things that I'd done, all the horrible lies that I told, all the times I'd cheated and manipulated, all the times I'd stolen, all of the times I'd hurt people. I did my own little version of cleaning house. And then I was ready to leave the hospital on the Thursday evening. And as I walked out of the hospital, I was arrested. Um, I've been arrested many times and it's not something I'm proud of. It's something I carry shame over, but I have to forgive myself for what happened in the past. But I've never been arrested and put on suicide watch before. Being put on suicide watch meant that I had to sit with an officer at my door all night to stop me from harming myself. It was a very humbling experience. And then two days later, I was released. Well, 27 hours later, I was released after being interviewed. And uh, I came home. And again, I was sat in this house. At this point, I was five days sober. But I wasn't sober. I was just abstinent. I knew I didn't want to use again. And I white knuckled it for the next 20 days until the 29th of September. And on the 27th of September, two days before... My sister, who hadn't spoken to me for the longest time because of the person I'd become and the things I'd done and said to her, the lies I told her to manipulate money out of her to feed my habit, called me. And she begged me to come to a meeting of Cocaine Anonymous. And like most addicts, I said, yeah, yeah, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. And on the 29th, I was so miserable, having been sat for 20 days on my own, Nobody rang me. Nobody cared about how I was. Nobody wanted to be anywhere near me. My addiction had completely isolated me. And I thought I would never know happiness again. I thought I would never be able to have a normal life. Could not see a way out of the darkness that I'd found myself in. So I decided I was going to kill myself again. And this time I decided I was going to go to a place called Spurn Point in England which is a cliff that juts out into the middle of one of the widest rivers in England. So I looked online to find out what time high tide was. 
and I had every intention of driving up to Sperm Point and getting myself a bottle of Jack Daniels and a bag of cocaine, taking a picture of my daughter and a picture of my now ex-girlfriend, who I thought I was still in love with, drinking the whiskey, sniffing the cocaine until I could pluck the courage up to jump off of that cliff. My body would never have been found. My parents wouldn't have been able to bury me. My daughter wouldn't have been able to say goodbye. But none of that mattered. All that mattered was that I thought I was the worst human being on the planet. And I needed to be away from everyone around me. But it was half past five and I had five hours to kill. And I was lonely. And I was scared because I knew it was all going to be over soon. And I had no idea what was waiting for me on the other side. So I took my sister's advice and I logged on to a meeting. And I'll be honest, my sister said to me, if you don't like the first meeting, leave and find another one that you do. I'm a Zoom baby. I got clean online because there are no meetings near where I live out in the middle of nowhere. And I went to this first meeting and I hated it. There were like five people in it who were all well-to-do, upper middle-class toffs, quoting from a book that I'd never read like it was the greatest thing they'd ever heard of and throwing the word God around fragrantly. And I thought, these are not my people. I was looking for the differences because I was a working class scumbag. But I remembered my sister's advice and I had hours to kill until I had to get in the car and drive to Spurn Point. So I logged on to another meeting. And in this meeting, people were happy. People were laughing and joking. I expected it to be one of these places where we sat around and moaned about how miserable our lives were. And after that, we went out and used. But these people were happy. And they made me feel welcome. And nobody had made me feel welcome anywhere for the longest time. So that meant a lot to me. And they asked me about myself. And they said, was it my first meeting? And I told them it was. And I complained about all of the things that I'd had to sell to pay off my drug habits and how my life had nothing going for it. And this old guy in the corner said to me, you'll get it all back one day and you won't want it anymore. I had no idea what he meant. And then I had the next spiritual awakening. You can't see me on the recording, but I'm quite a tall bloke, quite a big bloke, and I've got a bald head. And a guy who's probably half my size with a lot more hair than me and a very thick Irish accent comes on and he starts to tell his story. And he talks about his own fear, not being able to look himself in the mirror. He tells about how he had to shower and brush his teeth, sorry, shave and brush his teeth in the shower because he couldn't face the reflection. And I'd been doing that for the longest time. Talked about the suicide attempts and the wanting to kill people and the hating everybody and just completely not being at ease with himself. And it felt like he was telling my story. That room was full of people, but it felt like he was talking just to me. And then he started to talk about this book and this solution, this power greater than himself that he could draw upon whenever he needed. And that felt amazing. I thought, I want some of that. And I put my number in the chat and this man reached out to me. And I thought he was a rock star. He'd been invited to talk at a CA meeting. He must be super important. And he's making time for little old me. And we spoke for about an hour. And he asked me to do two things. He made me promise. He made me promise that I'd pray before I went to bed. I only knew one prayer. And I will be honest with you, I did it because I was told to. I did it from my head and not from my heart. But I did it. And then he asked me to come to a meeting the following morning. I never told this man that I was planning on killing myself after speaking to him on the phone, but I did promise him that I'd come to a meeting. This was the first person who'd rung me in the longest time and showed me anything like humanity. So I was going to keep my promise to him. And I went to that meeting the following morning and the same thing happened. People made me feel welcome. People made me feel like they genuinely cared what happened to me. I didn't care what happened to me, so why do these strangers care? But they made me feel that way. My first couple of weeks in recovery were a little turbulent. <clears throat> I went through two sponsors very quickly because they weren't right for me because Mark was still trying to run the show Mark's way. Mark thought he knew best. Mark thought he was different. 
And people kept saying to me, find a sponsor who's got what you want. Mark's still greedy. That's on his character defect list. So Mark had to find two sponsors. Mark has two sponsors who take him through the book in very different ways. But when I saw both of them, I knew I wanted them to work with me and help me get sober. One of them took me through the line called the muck away, which is a way of reading each paragraph and circling words and discussing what each line means. And one of them takes me through the OG way. And I've been with this man for the longest time and we're still less than a third of the way through the book. But we spend an awful lot of time talking about what this program means. So the step one for me, admitting that my life was unmanageable. I knew my relationships were unmanageable, my friendships, my love life, my family relationships. I knew my job was unmanageable because I wasn't turning up to it. I knew my finances were unmanageable because all of my money was going to the drug dealers. I never understood that actually it's my emotions that were unmanageable and my ability to deal with them on a daily basis. I cannot manage to feel the way I feel when I'm running on self-will. Step two was being willing to believe that a power greater than me could and would remove my problem. That was quite easy for me because I felt like the lowest of the low. So I knew I wasn't the most powerful in the universe. And by the time I got to step two, I'd been praying and meditating. And I felt like there was something there. I was starting to take that 18 inch journey, which is the longest journey any addict ever takes from the mind to the heart. And I was starting to pray from the heart. So it was easy for me to be willing to believe that there was something greater than me out there. And then step three, I get to hand my will over on a daily basis to God. There's a beautiful line in the back of the book on page 420 that says, I must keep my magic magnifying mind off my expectations and onto my acceptance. It talks about how my serenity is directly in proportion to my expectations. I've learned that if I trust God, completely hand my will over, the universe will provide me all I need in abundance. The universe has always been looking out for me. My God is the universe or the spirit of the universe. Each God's their own. But for me, that works. It's always been there for me, even when I turn my back on it. So it was easy for me to hand my will over. But I have to do that every day. I wake up and I say my third step prayer every morning. I have to consciously catch myself when I try and take my own self-will. And then steps four and five. This was a, an experience that, I don't know, most people, when they talk about these two steps, have very different experiences to me. They tend to fit into one of two categories. Either people are dishonest, they only half do it, they keep some of it back. And because of that, they invariably end up relapsing because they haven't been honest and moral about this. I was honest and moral about it. And the people who are generally honest and moral about it usually say the same thing. They felt like they'd put a rucksack full of rocks down off of the back. Like they had grown 10 feet and were free of all the carnage that they've been carrying around. Not me. When I looked at my list, I could not believe the person I had become. Triggered all of my character defects, self-loathing, self-condemnation. All of the horrible things that I'd had to face up to that I'd buried for the longest time. And because of that, my defects came out to play that first weekend. But my sponsor was very gracious and they took me through steps six and seven. And they got me straight into steps eight and nine. Six and seven for me are the forgotten steps. And yet I think they're probably some of the most important. I have all of my character defects. I ask God to remove them every morning. He does not remove my defects magically. He presents me with opportunities to practice the equal and opposite asset to each one of my defects. So if I've been intolerant yesterday and this morning I wake up and I pray God to give me tolerance, he doesn't make me tolerant. He presents me with a position that requires tolerance or a person that triggers my intolerance that I have to practice tolerance with. And by doing this every day, I become more tolerant. I become more peaceful. I was a violent offender and now I'm one of the most peaceful human beings you could ever wish to meet. 
And then steps eight and nine, making amends. As I said, I played up the first weekend. I did my four and five and I offended some really good friends in the program. So I was very, very blessed because it meant my first two amends were with members of the fellowship. They made me feel very, very at ease with this process. And then I went about with all of my other amends and I tackled them like a, a drowning man grasping for that reed. I wanted my amends done. I wanted to clean house. Some were easier than others. Some were very, very difficult. And with the exception of one, almost everyone said to me, when I said, how can I make amends? Just keep doing what you're doing, Mark. They could see the growth in me before I could see it in myself. They could see that I was at ease with the world around me, that I was at peace, and that I genuinely wanted to be the blessing in the moment to everybody I meet. But my best friend, who I'm going to tell this story, I always do, you know, was kind of worried what was going to happen when I went to see him to make this amends. I thought he might want to punch me in the mouth, and he deserved to. But what he asked me to do was to wash his car. He was throwing it down with rain. It was middle of winter, so it was filthy, mucky rain. The car was getting as dirty as I was quick as I was cleaning it. And he sat on a deck chair with four beers, joking that I couldn't have one, could I? While I washed his car, telling me that I'd missed a bit. And by the end of it, we were throwing sponges and buckets of water over each other like we were seven years old again. It was a beautiful part of my process. I genuinely believe steps eight and nine were where I really found the God of my understanding. And then you come on to step 10. Cleaning house, putting my foot on the ball, recognizing that when I make a mistake and I do make mistakes, when I let my character defects or myself will creep in, even for a moment, I have to be accountable. And then step 11, growing my conscious contact with God through prayer and meditation, doing my nightly inventory and looking at my day. For me, the spirit of the universe is unconditional love. And if I'm living in a practice of unconditional love and I love you, even if you don't like me, even if you hate me, even if you are horrible to my face, if I can still love you, then you cannot affect my serenity. I can offer you a lift home in the rain and you can say some horrible thing to me. You can swear at me and call me names. You can tell me that you think I'm the worst human being in the world and I will still love you. I might not stop to offer you a lift anymore because I'll offer it to somebody who I can help but I won't have any resentment about it because I'll accept that that's your opinion of me and your opinion of me is none of my business. Life is none of my business. I'm just an actor in somebody else's play because when I tried to be the director of my own play, it wasn't even a show. And then step 12, living by these principles in all areas of my life, and giving away freely what was given to me. Step 12 is where I understood what that little old man in the corner said to me, that I'd get it all back and I wouldn't want it anymore. Step 12 is me reaching back into the fire. When I was in active addiction, it felt like I was stuck in a hole. My parents had walked by this hole many times and said, you're an idiot, why did you get in that hole? Haven't you got any moral fiber? Haven't you got any willpower? Just stop. That didn't help me get out of the hole. I'd gone to church and the priest would play with me. But then he'd go back to his flock and I'd still be stuck in my hole. I tried therapy. The therapist would sit at the edge of my hole and say, tell me about your childhood trauma that made you climb into this hole. And I would get an understanding of what had made me climb into this hole for an hour. And then they'd say, great work, I'll be back again in a week. And I'd be left with all of these thoughts but I'd still be stuck in this hole. My sponsor stood at the edge of this hole, asked me if I wanted to get out. I said, I do more than anything. So they jumped in the hole with me. I said, well, that's no use. I needed you to throw me a rope. I needed you to pull me out. And they said, that's not how this works. But don't worry, I've been in this hole before. I can show you the way out. And they told me where to put my feet. 
Put your foot here. That's step one. And they showed me these 12 steps that I've just discussed briefly with you. And suddenly I found myself on top of the hole. And I looked down and there was somebody else in there. I could have walked away from the side of that hole. What I've learned is the further I walk from that hole, it's just closer to falling into the next hole, which will be bigger, darker and deeper. Or I can jump back into that hole and take somebody else by the hand and show them that there is a way out of the darkness. And I do that now. I sponsor people. They sponsor people. I thought the biggest joy was watching somebody get through this 12-step program, seeing the light turn back on in their eyes. I thought that was the biggest gift of recovery, I'll be honest. The day my first sponsee called me so excited because they'd got their first sponsee, that was the biggest gift of recovery for me. Seeing this person go from the shell of a person that came in to being so happy to help the next person. I worked out that if I sponsor three people, just three. If I can get three people through the 12 steps, usually takes me somewhere between 60 and 90 days, depending on the individual and their willingness. And if each one of those can then take three people on, and each one of those then takes three people on, by the time we get to the 14th set of people taking them on, we would have saved in excess of 14,300,000 addicts in a space of around about three or four years. With 8 billion people on the planet, that's barely scratching the surface. But that's just the effect one person can have. We never know how far the ripple of our actions will go. But I feel like I'm stood at the end of a pond or a lake and I've got two stones in my hand. One is good, one is pure, one is loving, one is kind, one is tolerant. The other one is run on self-will, self-righteousness, selfishness, self-centeredness. There's nothing good about it. I want to be the person who throws the good stone and cause good ripples. Because eventually those ripples will find their way back to me. As I said, I have a beautiful life now. I'm in a relationship with a wonderful human being who is kind beautiful and tolerant if anything i am slightly worried about her because i think she's far too beautiful for me but other people tell me that i have a beautiful soul and that's what i've attracted her to good job really because you can't see my face but it's no oil painting i have a daughter who reaches out to me when she wants help to ask my advice who i can be there for a daughter that i stepped over in active addiction more times than i care to admit but now she is one of the key parts of my life. Everything I do, I do for her and my partner. I have parents who can sleep at night, mm -hmm. siblings who no longer have to worry about where I am and what I'm doing or whether they're gonna get a phone call from the police. I have friends all over the world. My phone, which didn't ring once for 20 days, now I wake up to hundreds of messages from people all over the world mm -hmm. wishing me a good day, thanking me for helping them. Thanking me for being in their lives. I get invited to do things like this and I get invited to rooms to speak to people. That's a very nice feeling for somebody who wasn't invited anywhere for the longest time. Kind of blows me away. But most importantly, I have a connection to a power that is greater than myself. That has removed the obsession. My take on addiction from what I've learned about myself, my program, my fellows, is that this is a disease of three parts. I have a mind that tells me I want to use, that lets me believe little lies that will all lead me back to the great lie. Little lies like maybe my girlfriend wants to be with her boss, which leads to maybe she's already sleeping with her boss. Maybe she's going to leave me. Maybe I should use again off of the back of this. Maybe it'll be different this time. Maybe I've been sober long enough to be able to have one line. All these little lies that my mind wants to tell me. And then I've got a body, which when I put one in, I set off the phenomenon of craving, this allergy-like symptom, which means I cannot stop. One is too many and a thousand is never enough. 
and I will burn my life to the ground in pursuit of the only thing that I think can make me happy. And then I've got this spiritual malady, this hole inside my soul that I try to fill with alcohol and drugs. But the alcohol and drugs become less effective, the hole gets less full, and the pain and the hollowness inside me grows more and more. But I'm really lucky. We have a triangle that's in the front of the book and there's no, no coincidence that it's a triangle. Three sides, one for each part of my disease. Recovery for me is the first 164 pages of the book. If I'm in the book, working with somebody else or reading it myself, I am treating my mind. I'm stopping my mind from running away with itself. Unity is the meetings, the fellowship. If I'm meeting up for a coffee with a fellow or I'm coming to a meeting or I'm on the phone with a fellow, then I'm treating my body because while I'm doing that, I'm not out ruining lives, mostly my own. And spiritual malady, that's service. Service is my step 12 work. And that's not just inside the program, that's outside the program. That's seeing the woman behind me is in a rush on her lunch break and letting her go in front of me in the queue. That's helping the little old lady get to her car in the car park with the shopping bags. That's guiding somebody into a parking spot. That's just genuinely trying to be the blessing to everybody that I meet. Show them unconditional love. I don't put anybody on a pedestal because anything I put on a pedestal, I end up worshipping. The only thing that's to be worshipped is the God of my understanding, the spirit of the universe. I try and put everything else on the same level. I try and treat everybody I meet like the most important person to me in that moment. And because of that, I live a life today that is happy, joyous and free. Every one of those promises in the book has come true for me. So if you're listening to this and you don't know whether or not you think this can work for you, reach out, take my number, take anybody's number, find somebody who's armed with the facts about themselves and let them arm with them the facts about yourself. Find out who you really are. Because I promise you, you're so much more than you think you are if you're still using. There's a life beyond your wildest dreams waiting for you. It takes a little bit of work. It takes a little bit of soul searching. It takes a lot of faith. But the rewards outweigh any of the work. Your identity returning outweighs any of the soul searching. And the faith is a gift of its own. My name is Mark. I'm still a very grateful recovered addict. I'm a very grateful member of CA. CA gave me the only real home and the only real family I've ever known. And I love them dearly. And if nobody else has told you today, let me be the first. I love you too. There's nothing you can do about it. Thank you for having me on, Paul. Lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. Very relatable, completely understandable. Um, and Thura, thank you so much for being here. I so enjoyed listening to you. I listened to every word. Uh, I always enjoy your shares. You were kind enough to give me time to carry the message a couple of weeks ago in a group that I attend regularly. And I know it was widely appreciated. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, some identification. But before I get to that, I just want to say to folks, um, there's a lot of resources available to support you in this journey. Once again, feel free to put your number, your first name, your number in the chat, wherever you see this posted, and we will get back to you with resources and support and more information. <clears throat> of course, there's another, um, I don't know, another 80 podcasts on this channel covering uh, what there's one on each of the steps. There's two on step one and two on step two, actually. There's podcasts on the traditions. There's podcasts on the spiritual malady, the ABCs of addiction. Um, and uh, lots of others living our program, Why Do We Drift? There's also probably two dozen personal stories like this wonderful one we've heard today on the channel. So do get involved and look at look, look and listen to the other podcast. Bear in mind, you can rewind and fast forward and pause and share this broadcast with us, however you will. Feel free to like, subscribe and comment. And, uh, and of course, if you want to add to the conversation that me and Mark are having this morning, do feel free to to add to it by all means in the chat. Um, so I so enjoyed your share. And, uh, yeah, um, I related to the feelings of futility. Uh, I related to the feelings of isolation. Uh, I related to the feelings that nobody's bothering. 
you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was never sort of like a, a sort of a, 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 how would I describe it? Sort of like, I was always very a homely user, Mark. You know, I always, I, I, I had a, I had a job through probably 90% of my using, um, you know, and a mortgage through most of it and what have you, and usually a vehicle. Um, and so it was very much that character thing, but got involved in the supply game quite early on and then got clear for one and a half decades and then uh, thought it'd be a good idea <clears throat> and because it's a progressive fatal illness uh, you know it's that first drink of drug that ruins everything isn't it you know and uh, what I really have is a commitment to abstinence and a commitment to maintain a fit spiritual condition uh, and you talked about this beautifully you talked about um, how if you're in the literature uh, you're generally in a, in a good place uh, mentally, you know, and how true is that? You, you mentioned treating your mind. I like that. I like how you use that term. You know, if you if we don't treat our alcoholism, it will treat us. Uh, yeah, and a drink, right. a drink or a drug will will be uh, usually, in my experience anyway, towards the end um, of of that alcoholism already manifesting in other ways, usually and. Uh, uh, it can happen quickly. It can be a quick progression, but, but usually it's because I'm not in the solution. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to learn to, I think the fancy word is segue, S-E-G-U-E. I think I believe it means to move uh, seamlessly from one thing to another, uh, principally when you're talking. So in other words, to move from solution to solution. That's how it is. We have to be fluid. I think Mohammed Ali, did he say, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee? <laughs> Indeed, I love that. But either way around, we have to be proactive. And I really loved your share. And, uh, you know, on the screen, folks, as well, we've got a chapter from a wonderful uh, book called Alcoholics Anonymous, often called The Big Book, which is our basic text that Mark referenced several times. This chapter there is the solution. We have uh, The Big Book, 12 and 12, and, and other literature we can send you free. Uh, on WhatsApp, if you're interested in that, ask us in the chat. Um, yeah. And so I enjoyed your message, you know, and uh, you mentioned getting into bother. Uh, most of my bother was pinching a few cars as a teenager, a few minor assaults, mainly on the police, uh, and getting into bother, selling lots of drugs. Yeah, um, yeah. Under a story, Paul. <laughs> for some reason, the police objected to me sharing my spices. <laughs> Uh, well, I had a, a very similar issue myself, Claude, but, you know, it's a very different way of life now. And I tell you what, it's much but, nicer waking up in the morning not worrying about the police coming through my door. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, most of my problems stopped. I stopped drinking and drugging, who knew? And and the revelation that we can have a measure of peace and serenity without dope, what a revelation, who knew? You know, you know what? You know, what? I'd be a rich man. <laughs> I mean, oh, don't, don't get me not, started on all the all the money uh, blown on it over the years. I think I could afford a yacht on a holiday if I yeah. never used drugs. <laughs> oh man! But the money and the honey returns, you know. And uh, yeah, man. I mean, finance and romance are great motivators, both both to get clean and to stay clean, you know. And uh, there is a solution, you know. There is absolutely a solution. So to anyone that's new, I'd encourage you to come to some meetings. Um, we did have a screen up a few minutes ago, which I'll put up again in a few moments on the screen where you can get to Zoom meetings and get some encouragement and some assurance and some support. There really are people just like Mark that are willing to help you uh, and, you know, spend time with you in the book and talking with you about recovery to support you in your journey. There really are. In fact, there are millions of them. You know, yeah, I think the fellowship calls one of the most important parts of this program. You know, you literally have millions of people, and all anyone wants from you is to see you get well. Nobody wants any money, nobody wants to give you any lectures or a hard time. And it, it blew my mind. I couldn't understand that there were so many people out there like that. Uh, but the fellowship is one of the best parts of the program. It's so pure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's an ongoing miracle, isn't it? You know, you, you and I attend meetings regularly and just the power well it's really the presence of a higher power in the persons gathered in the meeting and the love you know i mean look meetings are not perfect uh, human beings are not perfect but it's not far off <laughs> the solution is the solution is really really good 
you know. Um, I think one, once once I figured out uh, more about the problem, um, I was then able to appreciate more about the solution and practice the solution on the basis of acknowledging the problem. And the problem was the physical compulsion and the mental obsession to continue using. Once I'd learned a little bit more about that, um, um, and gone through the process, then um, it's about growing and understanding effectiveness. Because in the real world, uh, people uh, ring up uh, in a bad way. You know, and the statistics are shocking. I think it's every six or seven seconds someone dies of addiction, that's all types of addiction. Uh, uh, you know, so while you're taking this breath, someone's taking the last breath because of physical compulsion and mental obsession, you know, and uh, uh, and so to go and understand effectiveness and really to be right with the higher power. I mean, for me, the higher power is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. For others, it's the meeting. For others, I've known people even use their sponsor. The prime thing is that you have a higher power and that you're taking clear-cut direction and that you've got some willingness and some accountability. That's the prime thing. Um, and I've seen people recover on that basis time and time again. Conversely, I've seen people not recover because they resist the simple things laid out in the book, you know. So, so talk a little bit more, if you don't mind, Mark, about you know about your process in early recovery. I mean, how was it for you? You said you got two sponsors. Would Would you like to share a little bit more about that process? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm obviously a rigorously honest program. I'll be very honest. Um, and my first sponsor was a great guy. I'm still really close with him. I love him, but. He was newly through his steps. He'd got a lot going off in his own life and he, he was having anxiety of whether or not he was a good enough sponsor. And I felt guilty. Uh, I met another guy who had all these rules. And um, for me, I think sponsorship, this process isn't to make you dependent upon a sponsor. It's to make you dependent upon a God. And your sponsor is supposed to just be the finger and the guide to the power that's greater than yourself. So I didn't really gel with the second guy, although we're still really close. I love him to bits. But the next guy I met was a guy out of LA who's just celebrated 25 years sober. And he he spoke with such clarity and really made me understand what this program's all about, this selfless practice and getting out of self. Um, and I started doing the steps with him, but he does what he calls the OG way. And it's a very, very slow process. It's going to take around about four years to get through the steps. So partway through step one, he asked me to find another sponsor who could take me through and give me the full 12 steps in the standard 60 to 90 day way. I mean, I know some people can do it in four hours. Um, and I went a wonderful human being, a lady um, who is one of the most grace. I mean, you know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to name the family me, but I think you know my sponsor. They come on your meeting regularly. Um and she's one of the most graceful human beings in the world. And she taught me what this book means and what it means to give away freely. I still meet with both of my sponsors. I'm still working the steps with my first one. Like I say, we're in the middle of step two. And <laughs> that's that's quite a, a slow process. But, you know, the first three steps, the 12 steps are basically contained in the first 89 pages, aren't they? The first 164 are, are the 12 steps in total. But you're at the end of step 12 by the end of 89. And steps one, two, and three are like the first 44 pages. They're the foundation that we build upon. So I don't mind that I go through it sort of line by line with my LA sponsor. Um, you know, we'll do maybe two paragraphs in an hour. But I've got a really deep understanding because of that. Um, and I say I went through the muck away with my female sponsor, which is a fantastic way of doing the book because it is, it's still a deep dive, not quite as deep as I do with my LA guy, but it gave me the tools I needed to deal with life on, on life's terms. You know, it's still going to rain, but the spiritual toolkit's like me having an umbrella. I can put my umbrella up and I might get a little bit wet, but I won't be soaked through when I get to my destination. Um, so, yeah, having two sponsors, two different spiritual experiences has been very uh, beneficial to me. I know it's quite unusual. Most people only have one, but very often I think people go through the steps with one and then maybe find another one who's been around longer and does the deep dive. I as usual, because Mark's topsy turvy, he did it the other way around, and he got the uh, the old timer to do the deep dive first, and then went through the steps with somebody else, so I could get the full spiritual experience. But it's been a magical, magical journey. You know, I, I can look in the mirror, I can shave, and I like the person looking back at me. I used to want to, everybody to like me and need to feel liked and be popular, and 
you know, say whatever people wanted to hear so that I felt like I fit in because I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. And now I've worked out that if I'm just my authentic self, the people that are meant to be in my tribe will find me and the people that aren't will find their own tribe. You know, I'm not for everyone. And maybe I'm like Marmite, but I find that when I'm my authentic self, I tend to attract more people and the people I attract are more like me. So, yeah, it's been a, a wonderful experience having two sponsors. I wouldn't suggest it for everyone, but it's worked for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love what you shared as well about um, the, the triangle, you know, recovery unity service. And, uh, you know, service can be any kind of service. And they, they did some research in early AA with people that relapsed, you know, and most of those persons in early AA were chronic low-bottom drunks and addicts, you know. In other words, recovery was a serious matter for them. And they made three pertinent discoveries. You know, most of the people that picked up again, they'd stopped spending time with the higher power, with the creator, with God in the morning. Um, they'd chosen not to develop their personal relationship with God outside of the 12-step realm. And they'd stopped helping people every day. Those were the three discoveries, the three simple and profound realities. So I'm talk about my own so experience with this, Paul, but just, what I've noticed just, about people who relapse is really they very often work the steps backwards. They stop giving away the yeah. they, they stop doing the rhythm they, they stop pretending and making amends, they stop looking at where they've gone wrong, they call the defects back, and eventually they get back to step one where they take the wheel back and they think that they don't have a problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh, absolutely. And we could do a whole podcast on that process. That's that's right. And that's that's right. You know, so the solution is if I want to stay clean and sober, uh, then I need morning devotion and quiet time with God. Um, I need to help people every day. Uh, and I need to build my personal relationship with the creator outside of the 12-step realm. You know, I've known people become proficient in the 12-step realm, but they've got very narrow Everything has to be seen, for, you know, and you can tell they can get a bit cultic with it. You know, it's not a cult. You know, it's a bridge to normal living. Um, and, uh, you know, working the steps backwards, absolutely. You know, and the, the sure, you, you mentioned it, the miracles in six and seven. And if I find myself in the defects, uh, which, which nowadays usually, Mark, it's like feeling like a defect's going to appear. Do you know what I mean? Like anger or greed or something, you know. Uh, it, you're aware. That's it. It's about self-awareness, isn't it? But if we feel ourselves in the defects, that's how you know, you know, that, that you can work in the steps backwards, you know. And if you're staying connected and supporting others, they will eventually someone will tell you <laughs> because the speech reveals the heart, doesn't it? I'm just going to tell a little story about my six and seven. For the longest time, my mother and I, my mother was, um, my mother's her own person, but we had a, a really bad relationship. But for the longest time, whenever we see each other, my defects get triggered and I become short-tempered and hostile. And I realised that every time I was going to meet my mother, I was expecting her to be the way she was, to say things to me that would belittle me or make me feel bad about myself and because I was expecting that it's kind of like self-fulfilling prophecy when I changed the way I was with my mother when I went there with a plan in mind that if she said something offensive to me I would just say well, I appreciate your opinion mum I'll have a think about that but today I'm just here to spend some time with you I'd got that plan up my sleeve but because I went in with a different mindset I never needed to use it and I realized that my mother had shrunk to the size I saw her because she was uncomfortable around me because she was expecting me being on edge, which put her on edge, which means she would accidentally say something that maybe she didn't mean. It's that whole thing, step six and seven. And it, I love how it talks in step six and seven. In one, it says defects, and in the other, it says shortcomings. I'm just going to tell you something my sponsor tells me. If I go to the shop and I buy a pair of driving gloves and I come out and I open the packet up and one of the fingers, all the stitching's out, well, that's a defect. That's not how it was designed. So I go back in and I get a replacement pair and I open them up and there's no defects in them. They're fine. But then I go home and I use these driving gloves to shovel the snow off of my drive. And within two weeks, they fall apart. Well, that's a shortcoming. They weren't designed to do that. And for me, that's the difference between defects and shortcomings. I know a lot of old timers say they just didn't want to use the same word twice in six and seven. But I think defects are the parts of our personalities that are just naturally flawed that we the behaviours we learn from surviving childhood 
um, and the shortcomings of how I use my defects. But I've realized that if I go into it with a positive mental attitude, more often than not, my defects don't need to come up. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really good. That's really good. Might I share another in inflection on that Love topic? Mark, um, I've, I've, I've come to see that, and this is just my perspective, that, that a, 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 a shortcoming is the manifestation of a defect. The defect is the interior state. It only becomes manifest if I act on it. So, so, so if I have a defective character, that's one thing. But if I act on it and manifest it, then that is the shortcoming. That's that's just another perspective. Absolutely, uh, yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah, and and these are the the treasures we learn in these rooms. You know, these are the things the gift of sticking around. Someone said it. Someone was sharing yesterday in a meeting here, and this person that was sharing had a number of continuous years of sobriety, and uh, someone commented that a lot of people that got acquired some you know a good length of sobriety time don't come to meetings and that that unfortunately is a stark reality a lot of people go back into mediocrity as it were you know and, uh, and that of course they're free to do that um but the point they made was the quality and the substance they bring because of the knowledge they've accumulated over a period of time and you know it's a treasure the not well the truth you know people say knowledge is good there's nothing wrong with knowledge get plenty of it you know, get plenty of it, uh, particularly if it's the truth. <laughs> you know, if it's the truth doesn't change. You only need well. You need to. We need to maintain the truth, I believe, because we forget. You know, and, and meetings help us with that. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I think my mind's like I say. I think I talked about it in my share, but it's the little liar in my head that's the addict that will tell me the little lies or trying to get me back to the great lie, which is I can use again. I don't need this program. The fact is, you know, it's a little bit like having diabetes or some other medical condition. I've got to treat this every day because yesterday's recovery won't keep me sober today. Mm -hmm. um, I might not always need to go to meetings, but if I'm in a book with somebody, that's a meeting. Meetings literally defined as two addicts meeting up to talk about recovery. So as long as I'm working with people, maybe I don't need to come to meetings, but I'll be honest, Paul, I enjoy the meetings. I like the fellowship. I like the love that I find in the rooms. And I like learning from different people because I remain teachable today. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. It's the quality and the substance, isn't it? And in this world of fiction and lust and sports and finance and prestige and all those things have a point, you know, the truth is still appealing. You know, pe people like the substantive truth, you know, and you do not to say that everything's wonderful. You admit people share their problems or the distortion of perceptions sometimes, but in, in the in the round, the truth is appealing. People love the truth, you know, in this world, and, and it's a powerful thing. But that does bring us to the end of the broadcast. Uh, so what I'd like to do is invite you to take a minute or two with any closing comments, anything you want to share for our listeners, Mark. Just, you know, obviously, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me, Paul. It's always nice to be invited anywhere. And uh, I think I said it a number of times, but this stuff actually works. You know, trust the process. Don't be worried about it when you come in. Don't be worried about getting on to step four or step eight and nine. Or a lot of people have, like, misconceptions about those when they first come in. But focus on the step that you're on and just try to do the next right thing. That's all any of us can do. And if you're putting kindness out there, show you the ripple effect means you'll see kindness coming back if you put in hostility and negativity out there that's what you're going to get back very much a karmic way of life but for me it's the best way of life i've ever had yeah me too appreciate you uh mark thank you for taking time to share with our listeners this morning really appreciate it. that was a beautiful message wonderful to spend time with you and uh yeah, once again, folks, do feel free to comment or to reach out for support. Or if you're looking for sponsorship on the screen, is a list of meetings. All these meetings are on Zoom, and all of these meetings are on every single day, all of them. So feel free to take a screenshot of this. Remember, you can pause, rewind, fast forward, and share uh, this podcast with us, whoever you will. Uh, in meetings, you will hear the solution. You'll hear messages exactly like this lovely one you've heard this morning. So come along to meetings, folks. You can recover. You never need to use again. It is a program of mercy, a program of loving kindness, and a program of truth. So once again, without further ado, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for having me, Paul. Shalom, shalom, family.
Stay safe, stay strong. Stay courageous.